you've ever seen the YouTube channel Venus Theory, then you probably recognize this guy. This is Cameron. He's a talented composer, sound designer, musician, and audio engineer. Along with writing his own music and scoring different projects ranging from video games to trailers, he also creates his own VST instruments, sample packs, and patches. Now you may already be familiar with his fantastic YouTube channel, Venus Theory, but if you're not, I'll link it down in the description for you to check out. And of course, today we're gonna go over to Cameron's and check out his home studio. If you'd like to support the channel, you can check out the affiliate links to Sweetwater down in the description. I've gone and made a bunch of different lists of the gear that I use in here, as well as gear that I've seen in other studios and found very inspiring. If you love seeing studio tours like this, hit the subscribe button so you can see more like this, like the video, leave a comment down below, and let's jump into it. Hi, I'm Cameron, also known as Venus Theory. This is my MTV Cribs. Man, it's really cool to be here. And, yeah, thanks uh, for coming down. Get a, get a behind the scenes look. It's, like I said before, it's, I feel like I haven't actually seen the space. And right. It's really cool to be in here. Yeah, well, you know, it looks cooler on video. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, we were looking to move down to Tennessee and I saw Colt Caparoon had moved down to the area. Uh, who's also from my hometown area, which is funny. And I saw his studio tour, I believe, actually on your channel. <laughs> I just saw that and was like, that's what I want. You know, because I, I <laughs> had never really thought of that. But, you know, growing up in the Midwest, like the bonus room wasn't really as much of a thing. So then you see these big angled ceilings and stuff. And I was yep. like, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. um, but I believe his house was custom built or something he said. But I was like, that's what I want is that situation. So we were... Looking around, I found a bunch of houses down here that had something similar, and this was the only room that was big enough to where I thought it made sense as a studio, um, but condensed enough to where I could, you know, afford the house it was attached to. <laughs> when we bought the place, this uh, wall wasn't here. It was just kind of like a little three-quarter or oh, half wall yeah. sort of thing. So this is just a stairwell. Um, so, it, yeah, it only came up to... I think you can still kind of see it about there and uh had a contractor come in and fill that out i was gonna do it myself but at the time you know we had just moved in and i really needed to get back to work yep so i had to hire a contractor but this was like peak uh lumber crisis oh god yeah. so you know just to build half a wall it, you know i don't even want to talk about how expensive that was <laughs> but it was you know necessary to sure. have a room um so when they did that i had them put in uh what is it, safe and sound rock wool or whatever. Yep. Um, so that works great, so it's super, super quiet in here. It has kind of gross, you know, 2010s, pretty thick, plush carpeting, yep. which is amazing for sound. Um, I have my old futon, some acoustic panels I built myself, and then uh, these are from Psy Acoustics. So when you put it all together, it's a great room to work in. I wish I could have a cloud up here, but you really need the ceiling fan. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And like the bonus rooms in Tennessee and the, the AC, you know, is not ideal. So I actually have a portable air conditioner back there I have to use. But, you know, it's 95 percent of what I think my ideal situation would be because it's so quiet. It's great to mix and there's really no, you know, reflections or anything, which is great for filming. You know, even as I speak, there's really no Bounce. roomness. Yeah. Which is great. OK, so. Explain to if, if for anyone who is unfamiliar with you some of the work that you do and how you're using this space to do that. I mean, as you can tell, it's something like a project studio. I do a lot of different things. Um, I run my YouTube channel, uh, Venus Theory. So this is where I film the majority of videos uh, are filmed in here. So that was kind of the first part of this room was it needs to look cool on camera. You know, it's got to have that like Instagram aesthetic or whatever. And I think it's also important just to have an inspiring place to work in. Um, so the other part of my work is scoring for games and films and apps and things. I've worked with uh, music libraries making background music that gets put in stuff. I've worked with other YouTubers writing intros. I've worked with podcasts writing little themes. Um, so that's the majority of my music work is that sort of end. I do my own original music, but I'm just, I don't know, busy doing that stuff anymore. And I really like that because I like the sense of collaboration that's in it sure. where, you know, the music is responding to something bigger. And I think that's just more interesting to me a lot of the times. Uh, but, you know, I do my own original music when I sit down and 
actually feel like getting it done. I should probably do that more, but you know, I gotta gotta pay for the room, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, outside of that, I do a lot of sound design work. So, you know, when you buy your DAW, when you buy keyboards, uh, when you buy loop packs, someone has to make the sounds that go in those, and that's me. I'm one of those people. <laughs> um, so I've done that's that really for cool. hardware stuff, um, done that for a lot of software, done that for expansion packs for different pieces of software I've contracted with you know, like all the sample companies doing loops and serum presets and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I've worked with music licensing places like trailer houses to do sound effects, like post-production effects design. So, you know, when you're watching a movie trailer and you hear that big, like someone has to make the big fart bass, that is me. <laughs> so, so it's a little bit of everything, which is why the space is like kind of chaotic, but yeah. it works because it like covers all those bases, which, I'm glad I was able to strike that balance in here because it's a big ask of a single room. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's nice that it's it's seems to be very focused in the yeah. sense that it's very synthesizer, keyboard, and software yeah. focused. Yeah, it's very very much a hybrid studio. I've always been a hardware person, and uh, I, I've always just found that more inspiring to work with, but. Compared to when I got started in music and, you know, even leading up to now, or even within the last, you know, 10 years, the technology has gotten so good that it just doesn't make sense to have as much stuff. You know, I used to have little LA-2A clones and all sorts of microphones and different things, but after a certain point, it just doesn't make sense to have all this outboard gear and all this stuff when it just isn't functional that almost impedes the creative process. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big thing for me is its efficiency, because especially working in games and film and whatever the turnarounds can be so insane that you just don't have time to Print. play with all that stuff so yeah. you know some of the luxury items like the pedals and you know little preamps and tape recorders and things i have them i use them but i only really get to use them when it makes sense and i have like the time or the budget mm -hmm. on the project to do so otherwise you know it's just this is the stuff i use every day that's like right here got all the software I need and I try to keep it as minimalist as I can. Minimalist in the sense that everything in here serves a very clear purpose. Sure. And contributes to the creative process. How long have you been in this room so far? Uh, man, what is it, 2023? So, <laughs> I think closing in on three years now we've lived here. You know, the past couple years time has meant nothing. So it's somewhere between two and three years, I think. What are some of the things that you've changed in here since you first got it set up and rolling? The acoustic treatment has changed. Uh, when we first got here, I put these up. This took forever to find uh, like expanding drywall anchors. Yep. Because they they weigh nothing. Yep. But they weigh just enough to where, you know, little thin ones won't work. So that was one of the things was figuring out where those are going to go. Um, I had more of them but now I have these. So this was one of the eventual things. So these are custom panels from Psy Acoustics. I designed the artwork on them and stuff. They're RGB uh, light bars and then the back of them is as well. You probably can't see that right now with all the lights yeah. on. Uh, they change colors and stuff. I have them set to a day and night cycle. Oh, cool. Which is really important because, yeah. you know, especially coming up here and if I'm in like the middle of a scoring gig or whatever, I don't see the sunlight because I have my, you know, double curtain, you know, DIY acoustic curtain thing going on there. So that was mm -hmm. important just to have like some sense of like circadian rhythm of like, I should probably go to bed. Yeah. It is three in the morning. Um, so that's really nice. And then with sound design work as well, so much stuff kind of comes through here, you know, various prototypes of things that I'm doing patches for and whatnot. So that's that was a big issue for a long time. It's just not having keyboards and stuff all over the floor because that drives me insane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I got uh, this one is actually a shoe rack from Amazon, which is like one of my best purchases. And it'll actually hold like a full size MIDI controller if you want it to, which is nice. Wow. Um, you know, my other shelf, the yeah, like, sh I don't know, stuff cabinet over here was another add-on, so it's kind of, storage is the big one, so I've got that, which is like a cubby drawer, and this is where all my microphones and cables and adapters and like, all those little things I lose all the time just stay in there. 
Um, <laughs> and then the shelves was probably the All other right. one. All right. Now you got it kind of split up between uh, yeah, video purposes, gear and video, audio. So I've got all my like YouTube related stuff over there. I have my uh, DaVinci speed editor and my monitors and tablet and stuff. And you know, all my charging things live over there. So cool to see the stuff that you use. <laughs> Camera nerds. Yeah, so I've got Probably the a7 III, a newer, uh, the little monitor that stays on that, uh, Comica something or other microphone, which I think I gave your editor my voice preset, so I'll sound like I do in the videos. Um, I actually <laughs> sound like Mickey Mouse in real life. Uh. Um, so yeah, that's all camera gear and other camera related stuff, GoPros and lenses and adapters and cables and such. And then over here is just kind of other things. So I've got pedals, a couple synths, a uh, few microphones in like cases. So these are my field recording kits. So if I'm going out doing like a field recording or sound design gig, those are my microphones for that. Um, I honestly don't even know what's in here. This is just other things. This is a blimp for my microphone kit, camera gimbal, mic stands, such. Uh, these are some measurement microphones for doing more. Oh yeah specialty recording and such. And then that's my great grandpa. He was a, a sweet pick. musician back in the 50s and 60s. So that's great grandpa Lyle. Wow. And his guitar is right over there. So oh, this yeah, you is, got some sweet guitars in here. Too. Yeah, well, I guess we can, shall we run through those? Yeah, let's see. Um, all right, so this is wow. Stella. Uh, this is a, the best I could tell, this is like a mid 60s. Someone in the comments might be able to tell me better. Um, mid 60s, probably Gibson LG Zero. I got this at a guitar center off a guy for $80. Oh my gosh. Um, it was completely smashed yeah. here. So this is all just wood glue, but it was just such a cool little thing. And it was like, when am I gonna get a, you know, old Gibson yep. for under a hundred bucks? And it, Oh, wow. You know, for being a completely smashed guitar. It's a really mellow kind of parlor guitar beautiful. sound. I really like it. This one is my great grandpa's guitar. This, best I can tell, and like, you know, kind of from hearing from family, my great grandma, my dad. Uh, my dad actually found this in his attic after he passed away. Uh, it was well before I was born, but best we could tell, and like from what we've heard from the Gibson people that we've taken it to is like a 50 something yeah gibson southern jumbo uh but you know like the gibson factory fires and such like no one really knows sure it's it's okay condition um it's very old pretty decent wow it, it likes it likes winter and it likes fall for the most part but some of the bracing is loose inside of it so some months, like if you play it, it just rattles yeah. constantly. Um, my dad took it to a guitar tech forever and ever ago that like shot screws through the bridge and did some pretty shoddy repairs, but you know, really cool piece of like family history and such. Um, Beautiful so when guitar. I was a kid, you know, I, I grew up playing this guitar all the time and I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And I do have uh, some of my great grandpa's records downstairs. So that's really neat too. And that was like a thing as a kid is seeing this guitar yeah. and like those records like oh my my grandpa made records like that's so cool i want to do that and then you know come to find out records are like not a thing anymore by the time i existed so. <laughs> <laughs> this is my old touring guitar back when i had the notion of being a cool rock star or something uh this is a morgan monroe dreadnought something or other um i don't even think this company exists anymore they might I know they don't make this anymore. This is my favorite sounding guitar, like acoustic. Just very Martin-y. Really yeah, warm. Nice. Yeah, love the sound of this thing. Uh, acoustic electric and don't know much more about it than that, but really pretty, you know, binding work and such. Stays in tune like you wouldn't believe. So this is like my touring acoustic for forever and is surprisingly still in very functional condition. <laughs> this is a recent-ish acquisition. This is a classical guitar from 
ADM. Okay. I think I looked ADM. into it and they're like a random Amazon brand or something. Okay. I found this at a flea market uh, heading into the city. And I, I was not even looking for a guitar that day. I just stopped in a flea market because sometimes they have the odd amplifier or like weird guitar pedal or an old tape machine or something like you never know what you find at flea markets and yeah. sometimes that stuff's just useful like oh cool it's a old broken tape echo thing yeah i bet i could fix that and then it sits in my garage for nine months um <laughs> so this is a classical guitar it was 98 bucks i think i talked him down to like 70 on it wow. i keep it in d standard it is just one of my favorite sounding guitars I've ever played. It's so... I don't know what it's, I think it's in D or something. I don't know. But really cool. Love the sound of this. Super warm, super chill. Really great. Just, you know, put that through black hole or something and done. This is a Epiphone <laughs> Thunderbird bass. Um, I don't really use this all that much anymore, as you could probably tell by all the dust on it. Um, which again, plugins and stuff have just gotten so good that the you know sampled bass libraries and stuff are just great. Yeah. So this is just if I need to really play a bass and do bass playery things, that's mm -hmm. what this is here for. This is my only electric anymore. As you can tell, I'm a recovering guitar player. Yeah. Um, I've, yeah, I've been playing guitar since I was like you know, a fetus, basically. This is my old touring guitar. Um, this is a nice. indie custom shop T style. I don't know. I've done so many things to this guitar. Uh, I had the wiring like redone, had pickup swapped out. So this is like a P90 and a lipstick, had a different bridge put in, different pit guard. I th think everything else is like the same. It was ultra custom, custom shop. Yeah, I, you know, and oh, and I had it, this put on backwards. Because oh, okay. Because yeah, I, yeah. you know, when I was playing and stuff, I would always like accidentally hit that and it drove me insane. So I just told my guitar tech at the time, like, can you just do that again? But like do volume tone and then the, you know, pickup selector, because yeah. I always keep hitting that and it drives me insane. This is one of my most recent things. This is an Algerian mandole. Ooh, cool. It's a 10 string guitar looking sort of deal. It was, uh, I guess, invented by a French Algerian musician, uh, El Hajj Mohamed, I don't know, I can't Going for the it. name, yeah. that's bold. Um, it's really cool stuff. I, it's this whole thing called Shabi music. It's this like regional thing in, mostly in like North Africa. It's really, really cool. Uh, so it's a 10 string guitar sort of thing. I don't know how it's supposed to be tuned. I have this tuned as you would tune a Renroco. I uh, really like the sound of this thing. Just such a beautiful sounding yeah. instrument. Can I hear this ukulele thing? Yeah, this is... Is it a bass ukulele? So this is my favorite instrument in the world right now. This is an eight string baritone ukulele from Kala. I had never heard of such a device. Yeah. Um, I went to Nam last year and I was looking for a Renroco and you know, we're in LA and whatever. So you'd think LA world music stores, someone's got to have some of the more exotic stuff. No such luck, but they did have a Chirango, which is this thing. So Chirango is also, you know, regional instrument. So we've got five sets of strings, but two, so 10 in total. And it's sort of ukulele-ish. I don't know what this is tuned in right now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and those are, are those nylon strings? Yeah, so they're nylon. Traditionally, this is actually made out of an armadillo, oh which gosh. is wild looking. This one's wood. So very bright, you know, chipper sound. And a Renroco is just a baritone version of that. Okay. So I really, really wanted the Renroco. Could not find one. We were at Nam, and I... I was talking to a guitar player. I wish I remember his name. He just started a YouTube channel. Um, and he said, hey, over at the Kala booth, they have a eight string ukulele. I go, okay, what? And I've, I think I've seen those before, like eight string ukuleles, but they're like tenor, but this is an eight string baritone. And as far as I know, this is the only manufacturer that does it. So I have this tuned in fifths right now. 
Oh, beautiful. And just such a cool sound. I love the sound of that thing. That is and so I, cool. I wish I could get that with one more set of strings, but that is a Renroco. Yeah. And I, huh. you know, living in Music City, you think you would find such a thing here. No, it's all guitars. This is just a sound designer toy for scoring and, you know, sound design stuff. Uh, so on its own, it doesn't really do a whole lot. But when you grab a bow, this is like, you know, every Saw movie. And such. Yeah, yeah. So inside is just some contact microphones that I got oh, on Amazon oh, right that were pre-wired and everything, and they have the volume control. So I have three of them in there, just in kind of the spots that made the most noise. Yep. And yeah, you can bop it, twist it, bow it, pluck it, <laughs> all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you know, I got like paracord. Wow, on yeah. here, which if you you know pull on the paracord tight enough, you can kind of get like some bass rumbly stuff. You know, there's just bits of metal and whatever. It's a really, really fun project. Other acoustic things, I've got the viola here, um, oh, which I beautiful. also do not know how to play. Mostly just to have, you know, access to different sonic textures and such, so. I've used that on a couple instrument libraries and stuff. Uh, this is a dulcimer that my brother-in-law gave me. Oh, wow. Which has a little, uh, yeah, you know, Amazon pickup on it. So this is just Appalachian dulcimer. So it's a four string instrument. I think it's in a, like a mixolydian scale, which is why the frets are so, you know, weird looking. Yeah. Uh, the cello I've got. So, you know, it's also like a viola, but different, and it does that. Um, uh -huh. I always wanted to learn how to play cello, and I still haven't quite figured it out, but, you know, if I'm working on something and need like, and I pitch that down like four octaves, it sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all the acoustic. So, <laughs> instruments, obviously, a lot of it is over here in the synth yeah. world. Could we touch on some of, like, the synth stuff, and, yeah. then, and then audio? So uh, my desk setup here is kind of just my daily drivers of these are the things I use the most in probably every project just because pragmatically it's annoying to have to like put synths on and plug them in and unplug them and yeah. such. Uh, so the MIDI controller, this is a Casio Privia PXS7000. Uh, it's one of their newest, I think it is their newest controller line. Uh, really incredible feeling keyboard. Um, it's all weighted, you know, full 88 keys. But why I wanted this one oh, beautiful. is, you know, it's a great MIDI controller, but it also has, you know, sounds in it. Yep. Which sometimes if I'm, you know, writing on something or just improving or noodling around or, you know, at four in the morning, I just get an idea and have to like get out of bed and come up here. It's nice to have something I can just turn on yep. and play without having to fire up, you know, the whole system here. Uh, attached to that is this. This is a Sparrow 5x5 five five, uh, MIDI controller. So this is just five knobs, five faders, and can be assigned to whatever in the session. So, you know, if I'm here writing string parts or something, I can kind of articulate different things. Or if I'm working with synth plugins or whatever, you know, I can tie these to things or I can tie them to different messages on hardware. So just a really useful little utility for like moving things around and making it not just like all the yeah. time. Um, the main one here is the Iridium from Waldorf. This is probably the most powerful synthesizer money can buy. Um, maybe the Osmos notwithstanding. So this does pretty much everything. Um, we get into a patch here. We can do wavetable synths. Waveform, so just standard, you know, subtractive stuff. Particle, which is a sampler engine and granular. Resonator, which is a physical modeling engine, which you can also run samples through. And it has a custom FM engine, so you can define up to six different oscillator sources. So, you know, effectively six operators, but they could also be wavetables and stuff. Import your own wavetables. You can run audio through it. 
to the effects or filters or through the granular engine in real time. You have three oscillators here, so I could have one be a wavetable, this one could be a physical modeling engine, and then this one could be the FM engine. Oh, cool. And it has 16 voices of polyphony, so I have three sound sources for each patch, or I could have eight voices and have two layers of this. So then on my second layer, I could have three waveform oscillators or something. It is just unreal. I mean, the, the amount of stuff you could do on this. So this is kind of the, I don't know, omnisphere in a box. Wow. More or less. So for analog stuff, this is the Archuria Polybrute. Um, in terms of analog, it's up there uh, in terms of just pure horsepower. So again, pretty pragmatic in that this does all the classic analog stuff, but with this big mod matrix, you can go way beyond what most analog synthesizers offer. So it's a great compromise between classic analog stuff, but still versatile and interesting enough to fit into a lot of different use cases. This is one of the weirdest pieces of hardware I have. Uh. It is a vector synthesizer, so you have four sources you can mix between. Okay. And it's got multiple different filter types that are very like squawky and resonant. Some are a lot smoother. So analog filters and amplifiers, I believe, but digital oscillators. Uh, capacitive keys here, so like the more I touch it, the more it sends a certain message. Sure. Uh, XY mod here, it's got, I think it's over 500 points of modulation. So oh it gosh. could be like a bass synth, it could be a really bizarre percussion synthesizer, it can be I'm a little bit of everything. So it's a lot of fun. Um, I haven't used it in too many projects yet, just because there's some like firmware issues with the prototype, but that's just mostly been a for fun thing. Over here uh, is partial collection of everything else. So Waldorf Blofeld, I just wanted one when I was a kid. So years ago, I bought one. Uh, the Iridium back there is essentially what that is now. So oh, nice. that's just kind of a fun thing. I still play with it every once in a while, but you know, the Iridium just blows everything here away <laughs> for the most part. Uh, Archerium Mini Freak, this is I think, in my opinion, still one of the best synthesizers for the money on the market, just because it has so many different uh, oscillator engines. So it does kind of like the Iridium, it just does a lot of different things that are very versatile. So I think this is a great value one because it covers so much territory where I think if you bought this as your first synth, you're just not gonna get bored yeah. of it. And being someone who's very, very into this stuff, I still think this thing's just a ton of fun to play with. Great keys, aftertouch, mod wheel pitch wheel uh, you have two layers so you could have a uh, you could have an analog engine and then like the noise engineering uh, they make modules they have a couple engines in the mini freak and micro freak really great effects uh, three effects slots um, analog filter three mode and yeah lots of different effects you know different reverb algorithms delay types stuff like that this is the poly and play which is I don't know that it's like a groove box I don't know that I would call it that. Um, it, it's a, I use it mostly as a sequencer. So yeah. th this thing, it runs off samples, and then they just did the Play Plus recently, which adds synth engine. So this is the Play, not the Play Plus. You have these eight lanes, and I could like go boop, 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 and then have it play forward, or have it play forward and then back, or have okay. it play like random, and I could have a certain probability of each of those notes occurring. I could have a probability of that note being a different note within a specific scale. If you're using the sample engine, I could have a random chance that it's going to be a different sample from within that folder. Really wild. <laughs> um, but in terms of like a MIDI sequencer, because that can output MIDI too, sure. it's one of the most powerful MIDI tools I have, especially just for more generative stuff or kind of trying to inspire ideas. It can output chords and things like that as well. Uh, Roland SH4D here. This is a uh, kind of groove box, but kind of not. It doesn't really have a song mode or anything like that. So you have four layers. So it can have like the 101, the, you know, Juno type sound and things like that. And then it has a drum engine with some samples and then some synthesis. So it's a great drum synthesizer. Lots of good voices, really handy tool for composing, just because it's useful on so many projects, you know, those old Jupiter sounds and... Yeah. What's, what's the model? SH4D. 
It's a pretty recent one, um, and a fun fact is it has a little like gyroscope in it, so there's a, I don't know if it's under the motion controls, but there's ways to modulate the sound by just like tilting it. Oh my god. Which is, I mean, it, it's like, it's a kitschy thing, but yeah. it is fun. But I really like this because it, it, a lot of people had very mixed reactions to it, but I don't know, that's the internet. So yeah. I've actually found this incredibly useful. I like this thing a lot, and just being able to call up like four really classic synth patches if I'm just doing like underscoring, very versatile, and again, just being a hardware guy, it's a great tool to have to get sure. that stuff without having to like open plugins and click and click and click endlessly. This is the Neutral Labs Elmira 2. This is one of the more interesting ones. This is a drone synthesizer that's pretty inspired by the Soma Labs Lyra 8, but this is just four voices. Um, I, I really don't even know how to explain this thing. It's semi-modular. <laughs> It's really meant for dark, you know, under stuff. Really cool filter, very aggressive. It has these little chip modifiers in here. Okay. Um, which, if anyone's familiar with circuit bending, it's kind of like that in real time. So it, it's these little chips that are just soldered together different ways. So if I want to change the characteristic of things, I just pop one of these in. Wow. And it changes the feel of you know, the filter or the distortion and stuff. Very clever, a lot of fun, and because it's semi-modular, it integrates with a lot of my other yeah. gear very nicely, but great for spooky drones and, you know, That's sampling yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, this is the PWM Malevolent. This is the meanest sounding synth I have. So if I need dark, cyberpunky something or like big aggressive analog, you know, brrrm type stuff. This is the go-to for that. And being semi-modular, you could patch different connections together or patch it into other pieces of gear or interface it with a modular system. Super fun, very crazy sounding, really unpredictable. So that's, I don't know, a really fun thing to have because it does these really growly, deep analog things. With the semi-modular abilities, it can go really far with other gear or just by patching different things together. But the the tuning goes across like eight octaves or something. Oh, wow. And the distortion is super, super aggressive. So it's a, it's a great blend of what you might expect from kind of a small analog synth and then just complete and utter chaos on the opposite end of the spectrum. So very fun, inspiring little box. Landscape Noon, this is a passive synthesizer. So oh, there's wow. no power at all. There's yeah. nowhere to power it. So instead it runs off the voltage you feed it from other things. So I have like my Archeria Keystep Pro here as kind of my second controller slash sequencer I use sometimes. But I'll run that into this and these generate different voices, but they all talk to each other. Okay. So if I have this voice going, it might sound kind of like a kick drum. But if I have this voice and this voice going, it might turn into more like a car alarm or something. <laughs> but depending on the settings, it, it completely changes. So this is easily the weirdest thing I own. I don't really understand it. And that's what I love about it, because it also has these like physical touch points to change the sound and stuff. So this is just a sample generating. Yeah idea box of chaos. Um, so that's Keystep Pro, just another MIDI controller. Torso T1 here, this is a algorithmic sequencer, I guess you could call it, uh, kind of based mostly on Euclidean rhythms, but you can customize the sequence. So this just outputs either voltage or MIDI. Really, really fun. I love just generating patterns and ideas from this. Oh, cool. And then inside of here is the Oxy One. Oh which is another wow. sequencer box, really, really powerful. This and the Polygon player, yeah, two of the most powerful MIDI sequencers I could think of. Also puts out CV so it can interface with other gear. Um, same concept as the play, kinda, so there's different lanes for things, but there's a lot of different sequencing modes. So it could be kind of like a piano roll, it could kind of be like a drum generator, it could be a weird probability-based thing. Um, lots you could do, and the people at Oxy or I guess just the one developer mostly. I, there'd be people in the Discord who say, oh, I wish 
it did this, and like a day later, he'll be like, here's a firmware update. <laughs> so really, really cool device. Let's real quick kind of touch on the, the audio side yeah. of it. The interface is the Arturia AudioFuse 16 rig, which if you're into synthesizer stuff or pedal stuff or whatnot, really, really great interface. So we have the outputs here, which we could have output to like a, you know, one of the electron effects boxes or, you know, overstayer channel or something. Two inputs here, three and four summed into one little eighth inch jack, which is cool. So if I have my oh, yeah. uh, microphone off my camera, I could plug that into there and like do some quick voiceover and whatever. On the back, 16 in, 16 out, and it has kind of a digital patch bay sort of situation, which is awesome for just routing different things where they need to go to like my pedal board or, you know, route the output of this into the input of this and then the output of this through those and then put it all back through here yeah. and such. Um, yeah, great interface for that kind of stuff. I have their AudioFuse Studio as well, which has four microphone inputs. Uh, so I've been thinking about bringing that back and then running that with like ADAT or something mm -hmm. just to yeah. have more mic inputs, but it's pretty seldom that I need more than two. Sure. Unless I'm doing, you know, some very specific like sampling and recording. So, yeah. you know, most of the time I just have this up. Uh, speakers, Atom Audio S2Vs, they yeah. are very loud and just incredibly clean sounding. They have the profiles on the back of them too, so you could tune, you know, ones like a little more bassy or something. The only complaint I have with that is in order to change the profiles, I have to like physically get up yeah. and then change it on each one. Yeah. So I, I pretty much never do that. I, instead, I have Sonarworks Reference, which I run on every session. So I have the room tuned with that as well. So that's nice. running all the time. Over there is the Atom uh, Sub 10 Mark II. Yep. So that's my sub. I was very against subs for a very long time, but I got that and then <laughs> for like a month, just fought with it, trying to find the spot where it worked. Yeah. Because it's it's not a tiny room, but it's not huge. So just having it behind the desk didn't work. Having it over there felt weird. Like I could only sit in a certain spot where it wouldn't cancel out weird. So I found right there works, and that's just where it stays. And I have it tuned just slightly too loud because most of the work I do, you know, being like film and game and sound design side of things, most people have like the KRKs or something that just have this really exaggerated low end, or, you know, people are listening to the game trailer on like their gaming speaker stuff that's, you know, very amped up and whatever. So I have that just slightly too loud just to get a better sense of how obnoxious the bass is. That's pretty much it. Um, microphones, I've got all sorts of stuff. Uh, Soma Ether. Well, that is very So it picks up signals from lights and parking meters or, you know, even cameras. Yeah. So I use this a lot for sound design stuff and you could touch these two contact points to kind of get different responses because, you know, it picks up like the signals of your body or the resistance yeah. of your body against the little thing. Yep. Great little device. Uh, field recorder, Tascam Porta Capture X8. So this has four microphone inputs, the two built-in capsules here and surprisingly good capsules yeah. on this. Mo I feel like most of the field recorders probably by now have gotten a lot better, but this was the first recent upgrade I did where I felt like I could actually use these in a pinch. So this gets hooked up to my field recording rig, which is all put away right now, but I have a set of microphones on the side. They're Lewitt uh, 040 small diaphragm condensers on the sides, and then in the center, kind of depends on what I'm recording, mm -hmm. but my main field recording mics are these. So these are the HC15 and the HC22, I believe. Yeah, from Rycote. Pretty recent microphones. Cool. Just some of the best sounding shotgun mics I've used that, you know, are within the price range of normal people. That's how you get the Venus Theory voice. Yeah, exactly. That's the microphone. No, it's actually the, <laughs> it's actually the $60 microphone on my camera. Um, and then, yeah, I've got, you know, some ribbon mics and dynamics and, you know, the SM50, 758, MXL, some stuff, uh, you know, other off-brand microphones that do the job because 
you know, as much as I'd love to have all the the Neumanns and whatever, it's just when you really put it all yeah. together, no one cares. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, that's always my litmus test of everything because I get super worked up about, you know, sound design or scoring or something and I show it to my wife and she's just like, meh. And it's like, okay, cool. That means it's done. <laughs> <laughs> to wrap this up, what are some projects you've either just had come out or people can uh, check out or? Projects wise right now, you know, mostly working in games that don't come out for a minute. I can't really oh, talk sure, about Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Uh, but one I'm working on right now I'm really excited about is Ground Branch. It's a first person tactical shooter game, uh, more on like the realistic side, kind of like, I don't know what's something similar to it, Ready or Not, people might have heard of. I love this game and I lucked out and got the gig doing the music for it. So I get to write cool, dark combat music. Nice. This is my favorite type of stuff to work on. And some of those recordings are actually with that EMF microphone. I went down by a police station and stuff like that to record, you know, radio chatter yeah. and stuff. That was really, really fun. And then I get to do the big, you know, epic drums. And that was a fun project. I got to go to a junkyard for a day. I, I paid the guy like a hundred bucks and just brought a baseball bat and he just let me go break things. So I got to record, you know, hitting lots of cool stuff, breaking glass and things like that. So I have tons and tons of samples and stuff I've recorded over the years for things like that. Uh, so that's one of the games I'm working on. I've got a bunch of new instruments I've made that are out. Uh, this is a product called Noxua I made with UVI. This is going to be free, which I assume by the time this wow. video is out, it'll come out. So this is designed with my analog synths, the EMF microphone, the horror box and then an audio engine I worked with uh, them to figure out with like effects chains and such so this is contemporary cinematic scoring stuff so that's going to be totally free and it runs inside of their free workstation plugin oh, wow so everyone can just go get that probably by the time this is out a uh, recent thing I did with my friend David Hillowitz alt strings which is for decent sampler so that's a free plugin we have a free version of this library the regular version is a lot of uh, ensembles and got cool like experimental cello. So that's actually my cello and oh, wow. uh, his viola and some other stuff. We ran him through a bunch of guitar pedals to make that whole library. Malevolence here is actually made with the PW Malevolent. Another free thing I made recently is Apocryphia, Apocryphia, whatever I named it. Uh, this is for Kilohertz Phase Plant. This is also free. So I built this whole library and it's also just one key. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the day gig for now in terms of like things I can actually share and talk about, but you yeah. know, I've got a lot of new scores and stuff in the works, got, you know, my new videos I've been working on, got some cool preset banks and things I got in the works, got some other collabs going, and that's the life of NDAs. There's, yeah. actually, there's actually an elite team of snipers around my house at all times. <laughs> that's really cool. I, I love the sample stuff. I'll, I'll try and get some links from you yeah, that yeah. I can put in the description for people to check out. And I've and got then... my music on Bandcamp and if Bandcamp still exists by the time this comes out, uh, you know, Spotify, I think I have it on there still. And What's that under? V Venus Theory. Venus Theory. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. And then you'll find my YouTube channel and everything else. My website has links to all the instruments and sample packs and okay, such. Okay, great. And yeah. Yeah, it's all, it's all there, probably, if I updated it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Hopefully... Yeah. Hopefully someone gets some ideas out of this or something. <laughs> yeah, this was a lot of fun and uh, you're doing a lot of cool work. So. Yeah, well, I, I try. <laughs> Again, I'll put links to everything down in the description and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one.